Hello everybody, I am Derek and this is Kerbal Space Program that we're going to be playing today. Uh, the way we're going to do this series, we're going to kind of be a tutorial at the beginning where I'll kind of show you guys some of the way some of this uh, Kerbal Space Program works because it can be a pretty difficult game to get started with. Uh, and eventually we'll transition more into being a Let's Play once we get a little further down the line. So this should be pretty good, especially if you're a new player. If you're a more experienced player, uh, you may be able to skip through the first couple videos fairly quickly as we'll be just kind of getting that baseline science stuff. And there will be a lot more talking about uh, the designs of the rockets and how some of the mechanics work that you probably already know if you've played the game for a little bit. Uh, so we will go ahead and start with that. So this is the first screen you get to after you've created a new game. Uh, you can see we've got all the facilities here. And uh, the first thing you're going to always want to do is go ahead into Mission Control. Uh, I should mention real quickly we're doing a career mode, so that means we've got a science enabled and money enabled. And uh, the only difficulty that I have changed on this is that I changed the crew respawn to not allow crew to respawn, because that just seems a little unrealistic, and I think if, uh, if my mistake gets someone killed, then I'm just going to have to deal with that. And I have changed the decline penalty on contracts to be zero. There's no decline penalty. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I should be punished for not wanting to do a contract and that'll help a little bit with uh, the you know the YouTube to get some decent contracts for you guys and not have to worry about losing reputation uh, every time I try to cycle through a bunch of them. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we are gonna look at these contracts we've got. As you can see we can only accept two right now since we have a uh, starter level uh, contract place here or mission control I forget what exactly it's called uh, but we will look at this alright and we're going to mm -hmm. gather scientific mm -hmm. data from Kerbin we can definitely do that on our first launch and we can launch our first launch so we will grab both of those you can see we get uh, an advance that's an amount of money we get just for taking it and then there is a completion amount here that you'll get once you finish it and the, uh, the deal here is just both of those combined and we'll also get a science and a reputation for completing this. So if we look at our active ones, we can see that our uh, advance was about 2,000 on this, and our uh, completion will be a little over 4,000. We'll get some reputation and a little bit of science as well. So now that we've got our two contracts, let's jump into the vehicle assembly building where we'll design our first ship. Now it's going to be a fairly simple ship because we don't have hardly any parts. And you can see as we scroll through these, most of these tabs are completely empty. Later in the game, there will be quite a few things in every one of these. Right now, there's not. So, we will grab our command pod. This is our only command pod we have. We don't have any other manned ones or any unmanned ones at this time. So we'll be grabbing this one. And uh, just so I don't forget, I'm going to go ahead and throw our parachute on top of it. Because that's a sad thing to discover halfway through your mission is that you forgot a parachute. <clears throat> so, we don't have any fuel tanks yet. We only have our solid rocket engine. So we will take that solid rocket engine and put it on there. And I'm going to limit the thrust to about half right now, because I don't want this thing to just take off ridiculously. As you can see here uh, with Kerbal Engineer, which is our only mod for this series, is going to be Kerbal Engineer, since it doesn't actually help you do anything other than give you numbers. And as an actual engineer, I very much like numbers. So as you can see, we've got our thrust to weight ratio of a little bit over 4, and that's even with this engine throttled down to half. You can see it's well over 8 with the engine fully going. So we'll throttle it down to half. That'll make our fuel last a little bit longer. Uh, we only got about 900 meters per second of delta V, so I'm not too worried about this doing anything too crazy. And we'll be able to grab our crew report from this. We could probably throw a science kit on the side of this guy. If we really wanted to. I'm not going to throw an engineer system on here because we won't need it for this pretty short launch. Hopefully that science thing doesn't make it too heavy, especially since we can't decouple the engine. But the engine's also going to be the first thing that hits the ground, so as long as, uh, as long as that's the only thing that breaks, we'll be okay. And let's just see if there's anything else we want to throw on here. We could throw some fins on, but I don't think that'll be necessary. That'll just run our cost up right now. So we'll run this guy. We're not going to name it or anything. Uh, crew, let it be Jeb. And uh, we'll light this candle, so to speak. 
Right, so we'll turn on our SAS to make sure it doesn't fall over on the pad. We'll go ahead and grab our crew report. This is our crew's assessment of the situation. We'll keep that. Let Jebediah EVA, that means he just kind of steps out. Uh, I don't remember exactly what that stands for. It's extravehicular or something. I like to think it's extravehicular adventure, but I don't think that's what it really is. Extravehicular activity, probably. Um, so we will have him step out, we'll turn the SAS back on, and we'll grab this goo canister once we're, uh, once we're up a little bit. So what we're doing is we're just kind of collecting a little bit of science. Uh, as you saw there, this EVA report from the launch pad is uh, got a, a data size of 8, which isn't important right now, but once we start transmitting things back, that'll become a little more important, because it'll take longer and take more electricity to send more data. Uh, you can see it's worth 2.4 science if we recover it, and 2.4 science if we transmit it. Now, these are not always the same like they are here, and they don't always fill the whole bar, but for something like an EVA report, they're always the same. So we'll just keep that, and we'll get them both when we recover later. Now, the reason we're not grabbing the mystery goo is that you can only do it once, so we're going to wait till we're up in the atmosphere, because that'll be worth more science than doing it on the launch pad. And I'm sure we'll grab it on the launch pad at some point later. So we need to check our staging here, which I forgot to do in the vehicle assembly building, but we want to make the engine in a different stage in the parachute, otherwise they'd both activate at the same time and we'd be firing our engine and dragging our parachute. And that would be stupid. So we won't do it. So we're going to launch, we're going to point a little bit towards the water once we get going up there, but we're not going to go very far with this one, so let's see how it goes. Alrighty, start pointing over a little bit. Grab our mystery goo. And as you can see, that was worth uh, 7 science there, but only if we recover it, only 2.9 if we transmit it. Alright, so we hit about 400 meters per second, broke the speed of sound here. Good for you, Jebediah. And we're still coasting upwards. So once we start going back down, and we're at a little bit lower altitude, I'll deploy this parachute. And hopefully, we will <laughs> coast safely to the ground. If not, then I'm probably going to regret turning off crew respawn that killed Jebediah in the first mission. That'd be pretty embarrassing. Alright, so you can see our uh, prograde marker moved away, and our retrograde marker is coming up here. That means we're now traveling down, vertical speed is negative, and our altitude is dropping. So, there we go. We've completed some contracts, launch our first vessel, launch our first vessel, and all these milestones. Very good. And those all get us some money and some reputation. Oh, we're going to go ahead and deploy the parachute here. This thing doesn't want to fall correctly because I've got this weird setup with it. We're going 200 meters per second right now. So if we hit the ground like this, Jebediah would be a Jebediah pancake. But hopefully we will slow down once this parachute fully deploys. It's kind of in a drogue mode right now where we're... it's got some resistance but not a whole lot. There we go. Now it fully deploys. And it does take some time to do that. And there we go. Now we're going... Eight, seven, six. Okay, and so we looked in the vehicle assembly building. This engine said it could withstand a seven meter per second impact. So if we land at six point six, we should be safe. Now this is always your sea level altitude, even on space bodies that don't have a sea, like the moon. It's always a sea level altitude, so the sea's right there. So we won't be too far above our sea level altitude here, but it won't be exactly at zero. And there's our shadow. We can kind of watch that come down as we approach the ground here. And we'll turn our stability back on just so the craft doesn't go tumbling down on the sand. But it might do that anyways. Alright, there we go. And we've landed our first rocket. The launch pad is right there. So, not going to set any uh, land distance records here. But we did go a little over 10 kilometers in altitude. So that's kind of nice. Let's go ahead and recover this vessel. We'll get some of that sweet, sweet science from it. Alright, so we see that we got five data for the crew report. 
this is how much that data is worth per data. So we got very little science for that. You know, one's almost nothing. And then we got eight data from the EDA report, still the same value, but a little more science since it was more data. Ten data at a higher value, so the mystery goo really got us our bulk of a bit. And then recovering a vessel that survived a flight, you only really get that for the first two launches or so, and it'll start drastically reducing in value. But that got us five more science. Parts, since we landed only two kilometers away from the launch pad, we get 97.9% .9 of our part value back for all the parts that were recovered. So there's all the parts that were recovered. These are expendables. We'll come down here below this little break. So the mono propellant, for example, we didn't use any of that. In fact, I probably should have just taken it out of the craft to begin with. And the solid fuel, we could have got some money back for that, except there was none recovered because we burned it all. That's kind of how solid fuel usually works. So we got $1,800 back from our craft. And Jebediah gained an experience. Good for him. So if we go to our crew area, we can see he's now got one experience for a flight at Kerman. And our money's gone up oh, considerably man. as we finished both of our contracts, which we can look at here and see completed. We got our money for that one and our money for that one. So we've got almost $100,000 between the starting amount and what we've got now. And here, get scientific data. So there we did that one. And there's some more milestones. So we'll go to our research and development area. This is where we spend all that science to unlock new parts. And as you can see, there's going to be quite a few parts to unlock. When we get down here, they get kind of expensive, like a thousand science to unlock these two. But right now, we're way back here. We've got the starting, which has these items that we used, and now we can unlock basic rocketry and engineering 101. It's always very important to consider unlocking something if it includes a new science experiment, like this one, for example, includes the thermometer. This includes some new engines. We actually get some liquid-fueled engines. So that's a nice bit to get as well. 26 science is what we've got, and these each cost five, so we are certainly going to just grab them both. Now in our second level, we've got some decisions to make. So this one costs 20. We don't, can't afford that, so we can eliminate it. This costs 18. We can eliminate it, and this costs 15. Now we got to decide, do we want this, or do we want to save up for one of these two? This is going to unlock some more heat shields. It's going to unlock another science experiment. The service bay is very nice. Uh, some drogue chutes, some radio mounted parachutes, radiator panel, that won't become necessary for a little bit, but we'll, uh, we'll be happy to have it, and a micro landing strut. So I think we're going to get that. Because eventually we're going to want to get some unmanned probes, which is not in that one, not in that one. There's an unmanned probe. Is there one in here too? Yeah, the probodobodyne. Totally not Sputnik, or Stay Putnik. <laughs> we will want to grab some of this stuff in the Science Juniors, a nice experiment as well, although it's kind of big, which is annoying. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little stuffed up this morning. My allergy's been acting up. Uh, so I apologize for that. This gives us another radiator, some antennas. So down here we've got a lot of our electronics stuff. We want to get to probably that guy, the Probodobodyne OKTO. And so that'll be nice, and the little solar panel. That'll be a nice uh, setup for sending little probes off to planets. So we can, you know, attach a couple science experiments, send a probe off to the moon, uh, you know, the second moon, which is kind of in the real solar system would simulate a captured asteroid or something. Uh, it's mostly icy, so maybe a captured comet. But we'll be able to send little missions to all those and just transmit back some of the science. We won't get a ton back, but it won't be a real expensive mission either. For now, we are going to grab the other science experiment because I want that barometer. <clears throat> so that leaves us measly 1.9 mm -hmm. science left. So let's take a look at what contracts we can do now. Eventually, we'll want to do this one. And in fact, we can probably go ahead and grab that, because I think we can do it on this next launch, if we want to. 
Oh, let's look at some of these. I don't really want to do all these test ones, although test at the launch pad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is pretty simple to do. It can get us some money. So I'm not going to immediately accept it, but if we uh, start finding ourselves needing money, that would be a good one to do. Orbit Kerbin would be a nice goal. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll do that on this next, this next one. So maybe we'll uh, do test the flea booster at the launch pad, and we'll just make that part of our very beginning stage of our rocket. We'll put a flea booster on it. All right, so let's set that over there for a minute. Did I get the service bay, or is that not going to be till later? Oh, I did get the service bay. Look at that. What a day. So let's throw that service bay on there, and let's go to thermal. Cats are trying to take this opportunity to jump up on the desk. I know they're not supposed to be up there. We have to keep knocking them down. So we'll throw a heat shield on here because we may be re-entering with some uh, speed and we certainly don't want to burn up on our way in. That would be a damper on the situation to be sure. So I'm going to hit X to engage our symmetry here and then just use the uh, WASD Q&E incorrectly there to find the orientation that I want. We'll kind of sit those guys off to the side. And they're clipping into the edge of the service bay a little bit, but that's not a huge deal. We'll move them up just a smidge so they're not looking so ridiculous. So we'll go ahead and do that. We don't have a whole lot in the way of any of this stuff. We don't really need to worry about communication since this is a manned vessel and we're going to have a pilot on board. We will throw a Kerbal Engineer in here. I'm going to turn off the symmetry. Throw a Kerbal Engineer chip, and that is clipping into the bottom of that little bump there, but oh well. These guys are going to stick on the outside of the ship because I like them there, where this guy can jump out and grab the data very easily, and you'll see why I want to do that once we get going. Now uh, we've already got our parachute here. But I'm going to go ahead. I don't think we'd need radial mount parachutes for this, but maybe I'll put the drogue chutes on. These guys are pretty small. Put some drogue chutes on there. Even though we probably won't need it, just get a little bit more oomph for this parachute so we don't blow up any of our stuff. Well, I believe the heat shield is capable of withstanding uh, yeah, 9 meters per second impact, so that's pretty good. As long as we keep him around, we should be fairly safe. Now we'll go into coupling, put our stack decoupler on here. This just allows us to separate sections of our rocket. In a staging maneuver, we'll go to fuel tanks, and all we have right now is this little tiny fuel tank. So we'll... I'm hitting Alt to copy the entire stack of things here, which we probably don't need anywhere near that much right now. Throw the Reliant on there. See, that gives us a 3.6 thrust to weight and 1700 meters per second of delta V. Maybe throw a few more of those tanks on there. That ought to be fine. And then, since we do want to get that, get that contract, we'll throw this guy on here and put a fleet booster on the bottom of it, which will have a 2.6 thrust to weight ratio and a burn time of 8 seconds. So we're going to burn through that guy very rapidly. Let's see, let's go up here and uh, bring the drogue chutes into their own. So drogue chutes are not quite the same as normal parachutes. They can deploy at a much higher speed, but they don't provide as much slowing down as a actual parachute does and actual parachute. So we'll grab those and move them to their own stage so we can deploy a little early. And uh, this has 2.3 kilometers per second of delta V. That'll be plenty to get us into space, although it will not be enough to get us actually into orbit. We don't want to get into orbit yet. We probably could if we were really determined, but I'm in no hurry. It's not like we got a limited number of launches or anything. And we'll just call this, uh, I don't know, what should we call this? Ooh, I'm terrible at making up names of things. We'll call it the uh, Kerman One. Kerman being the last name of all the Kerbals. So we'll do that. 
maybe uh, maybe later I'll come up with a bunch of different rocket names and <laughs> throw them on the on the side of my screen here, but I did not think to do that. All right, so our staging. We really should check this in the vehicle assembly building, but I very rarely remember to. So we're going to do the solid rocket, then we'll separate it, then we'll activate the liquid-fueled rocket, then we'll separate it, and then we'll do the drogue chutes, and then the main parachute. So this time the computer got it right, and we don't have to fix the, <laughs> the staging at all. <laughs> SAS is on, we're fully throttled up, although that doesn't matter for a solid rocket engine, that only will matter for our liquid-fueled. Solid rocket, you can't stop it once it's going, and you can't change its throttle other than doing the thrust limiter, which you can only do inside the vehicle assembly building. And that's because of the way solid rocket boosters work. It's based on the way the uh, solid fuel is cut inside it. it. Gives you the burn pattern, which decides how much thrust you have. So that can't be altered on the fly. We'll go ahead and light this candle. Here we go. We're not gonna do straight up, because that's a little dangerous for the entry to go straight up and down. We're going to throttle that down pretty quickly because we don't need two and a half Gs of acceleration. To go straight up and down is a little bit dangerous. It would be your most efficient way to just get to space, but it's going to be a little bit dangerous, and so we need to be careful about that. Longer pressure data is there. Now, theoretically, we should probably wait until we get to uh, at least upper atmosphere before we log into this stuff, but... We haven't got the pressure data in low, and we'll have plenty of opportunities to get it in the upper atmosphere later. So, as you can see our fuel here kind of going down. That's uh, for our liquid fueled engine. Even a little bit more, although we're already looking like we're going to pass 30 kilometers. And we've still got a ton of fuel left. This engine's actually reasonably efficient. We've got over 300 ISP right now. So, we're really not hurting for fuel. In fact, once this goes a little over 70, I'll probably cut the engine and use it to help us slow down on the way back in. Just because I'm a little worried about this more direct, straight fall back down to Kerbin. You don't get as much atmosphere to help slow you down there. Alright, we'll just let that go up to 75 and we'll cut that engine there. Open the service bay. Grab one of our goo canisters here. The goo is very cold. I'm sure it is. And uh, we'll grab a crew report from him, which we could transmit. Do we have? No, we don't have transmittability. So we'll actually wait and grab that crew report once we're in space. I don't think we can EVA. <coughs> yeah, we haven't, we haven't unlocked the science to EVA off the surface yet. So this is the map view. You can get to this by hitting M, and it kind of shows you your trajectory. So we're going to go up to about 76 kilometers and then land out in the ocean. This green line is our signal back to Kerbin, which right now we don't have, I didn't put an antenna on this thing, so it doesn't have a very good one right now, but it's got something. And uh, as you can see, it can't transmit, but we can receive some signals from Kerbin. Oh, here's various more records that we've got. And it uh, looks like we completed our test to do the flea booster because we activated it on the launch pad. And more things have popped up already. Escape the atmosphere, we did that. And some more milestones. All right. So now that we are in space, we'll go ahead and open this guy back up. We'll grab the other one of these and observe it. Okay, it's gonna be some more science for us. That's good. We can always use more science. And we'll grab our crew report from here. And we can't EVA him yet. We don't have that ability. But before too terribly long, we will be able to EVA people in space, and then we can grab some more, we could grab some more science from that. So we'll just kind of point him towards where his retrograde is going to be, and now that we're in space, we can do proper time acceleration. But the computer will kick us out of that once we hit 70 kilometers again, that's where the atmosphere starts. I'm just going to set him about, I guess we'll set him on his retrograde vector, but he's surprised it's this leaned over right now. So once we get kind of low, we'll uh, activate that engine, burn up this last little bit of fuel. It looks like we've got 400 meters per second of delta V left. So that's that's pretty good. We are uh, we should not be too worried about burning up on this one unless this ship just starts tumbling on over itself uncontrollably, which would be not good at all. 
So it doesn't have a ton of control authority at these kind of altitudes, and we're about to be flying down through the atmosphere pretty quickly. So hopefully that doesn't happen, but uh, if it does, I guess we'll just have to deal with it. Just have to deal with it. All right, we're at 800 meters per second, 40 kilometers. We're still still quite high up. The atmosphere is not real thick yet. See, electric charge, we're doing all right. We're using some of our electric charge here as we move the ship around because it's using the reaction wheels. There's the, the launch center over there. Oof. And see, I was in orbital view and not surface. That was kind of a rookie mistake. I should have been paying better attention to that. All right, now we're at about 25 kilometers. Now we're moving downward through the atmosphere pretty quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up the engine right now just so we can ditch it in a second. <clears throat> so we're going to ditch that guy because it's just going to get in the way now. Deploy our drogue chutes. Those will slow us down a little bit. We are at what, 8 kilometers. Our main chute, it'll go into its kind of drogue mode. And the drogue chutes will do a more full deployment before the main chute will be able to. And since we're landing on the ocean, we can trust our altimeter now to be pretty accurate. So we'll just kind of wait for this to, to flutter on down, see what we got. We've broken the land distance record now 32 kilometers. So Space Center is way over there. Still not, <laughs> not doing anything too crazy distance wise. We are we'd be better off just hopping in a boat at this point. We wasted a lot of energy going up. All right, so there you see the drogue chutes fully deploy, and that slows us down to about 28 meters per second. Now, if we'd put the full big chutes on there once all that deployed, we'd be just hardly moving. But drogue chutes do not provide as much resistance, but they're a little tougher, so that's pretty nice. And these, this one should deploy around a thousand kilometers. So we can do a time acceleration here, but it's called physics acceleration. It's limited to four times, and it can be a little bit dangerous if you're not careful. So I like to not do it while the parachutes are deploying when we're in high stress situations. And with larger ships, it can really, it can really mess with you. So let's see. All right, we're well under the nine meters per second that this, uh, that this guy said it can take. So we should be pretty safe here. Let's go ahead and turn it up to four times so we don't have to wait for this entire thing to flutter down. And we will we'll see it shortly. Six. Yeah, we, we overkilled the parachutes a little bit, but with just this one, we may have been in a little bit of trouble. Better safe than sorry. We'll get a decent bit of our money back from these parachutes anyways, since we're uh, going to recover them. Plus, if you manage your space program reasonably well. I mean, you don't even have to do everything even remotely perfect. Maybe you have plenty of money. Alright. And so we can EVA him and grab just a little bit of science here. We'll grab an EVA report. And uh, I'm going to take all the data and store all the data. I'm going to take that data. I'm going to take that data. Then I'm going to get back in here. And what we're going to do is now we can take another crew report because I took it out and stored it. And we can log both of these again and get a little bit of science from them. So it's not going to be any, you know, world ending amounts of science, but it'll be some. And that'll be nice. It's here at the beginning of the game, every little bit counts. Later, it won't matter. We'll, we'll be able to produce way more science than is necessary for the tech tree. But right now, we want to get some of those parts. All right, so we were 50 kilometers away from the KSC, so we get 95% value back. That's not too bad. We're getting most of our money back on this. And I forgot to empty the monopropellant again. All right, and that'll be it for this episode, and we'll see you again in the next one. Have a good one.